Thank you for downloading this podcast on 702.co.za or capetalk.co.za. Leaders say two years old and making a difference. The Naked Scientist on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk with Reedy Clappy. 25 minutes to 10 o'clock. And of course, The Naked Scientist is brought to you by MWeb. MWeb, connect and you can. Hello, Chris. Long time no speak. Yeah, I think uh, I've been feeling similar to the way you sound like you've been feeling. I've had a funny cold. Everyone's ill. She, I, I, in fact, I was just saying I'd never been ill for that long. I'd have I'd, I'd have a cold for a day or two, but I was out for like nine days. So, and the voice yeah. is still not uh, up to scratch, but <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> Lots of people are complaining of the same thing. And mm. I don't know if this is a slew of one thing after another, like a virological domino effect. Or instead, whether what we're seeing is that there's some really nasty viruses floating around and they infect you once and lay you low for weeks. But, yeah, lots of people have got the same thing. Chris, I anticipated that we'd get a lot of questions about Hurricane Sandy. It is a global news story. We're still talking about it. There were fears mm. that it would affect uh, the New York Marathon. Uh, the, the variety of questions here. People want to know what what makes the one tropical storm or, uh, or hurricane different from another. How do we know its name? What starts it off? What can you tell us about what has been happening? Okay. The, well, this storm is slightly exceptional because it wasn't just a hurricane. It was a hurricane that fused its way into a number of other storm systems and made a very, very large storm system. And it was literally thousands of kilometers across. It was huge. Most hurricanes start in the Gulf of Mexico, which is the bit down at the south of America where Texas and Florida is. And the reason for that is that you have over the course of a long summer heating of the water and when the water reaches a critical threshold temperature of above 80 degrees C, uh, let's see, 80 degrees Fahrenheit or so, then the water starts to evaporate at such a rate that you end up with a column of, of rising, very warm, water-saturated air. And as the air rises, of course, it expands because the pressure is dropping and the expansion causes the temperature to drop a bit. This causes the uh, water vapour to condense into droplets and this releases even more energy, which kickstarts the process even more. So you end up with this very fast column of rising air. This then pulls in air to replace it from across a very big swathe of the planet. And because the planet is spinning, this means that you have this thing called conservation of angular momentum. The air that's being pulled in to one tiny place over the Gulf of Mexico is coming from across a very large bit of the Earth's surface, so the spin is all concentrated in one small place. And if you watch, say, an ice skater, or, say, a person doing a pirouette if they're a ballerina, when they have their body parts out at a great distance from them, they can turn quite slowly. But if they pull their arms and legs in close towards their body centre, they speed up because of conservation of angular momentum. Mm. So as this moving air comes in towards one tiny place in the Gulf of Mexico, it's forced to spin faster and faster and faster. And that's when you end up with your eye of the hurricane. And these then migrate over the water because the water, the heat from the water is what's sustaining them. And they then migrate and usually make landfall, usually over the southern parts of the US. Mm. This one was slightly different because there were these other just by chance storm systems that were f that were brewing over the northern parts of the country and the whole thing merged together into one very big storm mm. it wasn't anything like as powerful as hurricane katrina which uh, yes. in 2005 devastated new orleans and the southern states but it was nonetheless devastatingly powerful and made landfall over the northeastern u.s states mm. with 90 mile an hour winds i was talking to a friend of mine who is a medical student in she lives in new york and I was talking to her last night to find out what had happened, and she said it was really spooky because she lives on the 25th floor of an apartment block, and she said it was very, very, very scary because mm. although the building was fine, it was swaying backwards and forwards, and she said, I will probably remember that sensation of my apartment swaying backwards and forwards in these 90-mile-an-hour gusts for the rest of my life. Now, the buildings are designed to do that so they don't break down and, and fracture. They're, they're, they're designed to move. 
but it's still very, very scary. And she said it's amazing because where I live, um, you wouldn't know anything had really happened apart from the odd tree that's fallen over in the street. But if you go a couple of blocks down the road, there are flooded subways, there's no electricity, and there's a complete disaster. So it was quite focal in its effects as well because it brought so much water. I think one of the other things to mention with this, mm. and, and this sort of plays into the perfect storm side of it, is that also it coincided with the moon being in just the right place and that meant that we were already on very high tides, we were on spring tides. And that means that already the, the sea level that was coming is going to be high. And mm -hmm. then when you have a very low pressure storm system over the sea, because of the low air pressure, the water is effectively drawn up an additional height under the storm. So you get the height of the spring tide, the high tide, plus you get the additional increase in tidal height owing to the low pressure. And that means that you're much more likely to get flooding. And that's exactly what happened. Mm, mm. I, I am fascinated though, uh, Chris, at the ability of the experts to, 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 to predict with so much precision the direction of, of the, of the wind, the hurricane, where it's going to go, where it's going to land, when it's likely to, to, to subside. How does that all happen? Well, the computing that runs weather prediction is incredibly powerful. Just in the UK, the Met Office, which is based in Exeter in the southwest of the country, have computer systems that are the size of football fields, which are crunching data. And what they're doing is running various models. They take the data that we have measured from various sources, both in space, on the ground, looking at pressures, they look at temperatures, they look at wind speeds, and they integrate all of this data together and using various models that they slowly are refining all the time over time, they make predictions about based on this sort of pattern of findings, what are the likely outcomes? And they're able to then build a forecast of what they think is the most likely average outcome from these sorts of parameters that they're seeing. And over the years, they're getting better and better and better at doing it. Okay, thank you very much, Chris, for that. I'm sure we'll have more questions coming through. Let's go straight to the lines. Sean in Randburg. Good morning, Rudy. Good mm. morning, Chris. Um, just a question, Chris. Uh, we have uh, currently on display in, in, in Cape Town uh, cad cadavers that have been uh, plastinated or, or, or somehow polymerized. Yeah. Or whatever. Mm. Um, I was interested to find out if, uh, what the exact process is and what the polymer... Uh, what the process is you in used in introducing the polymer into these cadavers okay. to be able to make, to put them on display, and what type of polymer it is. All right, so this process Hello, that you sure. spoke, about, spoke about, plastination of bodies or something, yeah? Yes. Um, there's a number of people who do this. I don't know what the chemical in the polymer is, but it is a polymer, exactly as you say. And the way that they usually do this is to use the vasculature. In other words, the blood vessels. So what you do is open uh, a blood vessel in usually the leg because that's big. Sometimes they use the neck. And you go into an artery and you also go into a vein. And into the artery you pump water to start with, salty water. And you do this until you're flushed out from the bloodstream all of the blood and the blood cells and you get fresh water coming up because if you put water into the, or the, the salt water into the artery then it goes all the way through the arterial tree through the tissue in the capillaries and then coalesces back in the veins and so if you have that circuit running and you do it for a, a reasonable period of time you can flush out all of the normal blood from the tissue then what you do is to start pumping in another chemical which then replaces the bloodstream with the new chemical and then you polymerize that chemical usually by initiating a polymerization reaction so you put something in that's an activator and where the, this meets with the polymer it starts a chain reaction and then wherever the polymer chemical is it then turns into a solid foamy like material or a solid rubbery material and because it's in all of the blood vessels and the blood vessels visit all of the tissues in the body you end up with very fine meshwork of polymer all through the body and you can then take away or strip away the tissue which is the the normal meaty bits of the body you can do that with various enzymes and, and processes to break it down leaving behind the polymer which is not susceptible to the breakdown of the of these digestive enzymes or other chemicals thank you very much sean very current in south africa this issue at the moment uh, tony in durban hi hi morning morning mm -hmm. um my question for the naked scientist is I was looking at myself in the mirror this morning and I'm going grey and I want to know 
why we go grey. Okay, we've had this question before, but it won't hurt to go back to it. Chris? You, you, haven't, you haven't used your hair dye, Tony. That's the reason. <laughs> <laughs> no, I shouldn't be. I, I noticed a couple. I've got a couple of them coming just in front of my right ear. Just in that one place. Why is that? Uh, the reason we go grey is because you lose from the hair follicle, which is the collection of stem cells and the little ring in many places all over your head. You have hairs coming out of hair follicles, these ring of stem cells. You have in those follicles also melanocytes, the cells that make the, the dark pigment melanin, and they live in the bottom of the follicle. And when the hair filament, the little um, white stub of hair, comes through, they add melanin to the hair, and so they're adding a dark colour to it because the natural colour of hair, being as it's a protein called keratin, is white. If you don't add that melanin, then you get a white hair. And when we first go grey, what you're seeing is the effect of a hair either having a reduced amount of melanin in it or being one white hair amongst many dark hairs. And so it looks grey from a distance because you're seeing a little bit of white in amongst dark. And then as more hairs turn white, you seem to go more and more grey until you have white hair. Thank you very much, Tony. Good luck to you. <laughs> Bernard in Florida, hi. Good morning. I'd like to discuss the theory of the existence of parallel universes. Chris? Uh, go on. Uh, I'd like to know, um, is, there, is there proof? Does it exist? Or is it just a theory that's been flaunted at the moment? Parallel universe, okay. Yes. Hello, Bernard, yes. Well, the answer is it's very much a theory because we, we haven't got any way of, uh, at the moment of saying these things definitely exist. But scientists are doing experiments to find them. One person who's written a very good book on parallel universes, if you want to give it a read, is a guy called Michio Kaku. Um, Michio, M-I-C-H-I-O, Michio Kaku, K-A-K-U. He is in New York in America. And his book is called Parallel Universes, mm. funnily enough. Now, if you read, if, well, to, to cut a long story short, um, one of his theories, uh, one of the things he's suggesting is that uh, wherever we have a black hole, black holes are putting lots of matter into a white hole. So, in other words, the arse end of a black hole is a white hole, which is a new big bang going off in a new universe. That's one idea. We could possibly detect parallel universes because if they exist mm -hmm. and we have a multiverse where there are lots of universes parallel to our own, we think that the one thing that can propagate between them are, is gravity. And so what scientists are doing are gravity experiments because we think that if we get gravity coming out of one and into another, we should be able to detect its effect on things in this universe. And so there are various experiments being done to, to look for that effect. And if, if gravity comes through as a wave, so because gravity waves would propagate between the two, then it's possible that the space, um, say, say here on Earth, if you got a gravity wave from universe number one came into our universe, say we're universe number two, then it would compress or stretch mm -hmm. a bit of the uh, space it was passing through, and that we could detect because what, what you can do is to take a very long distance between two things and pass a light beam backwards and forwards between them, and we know how fast the light should travel, so if gravity waves come through and they change the, the length of the path temporarily, we should see a blip, because the light will take a different time than usual to go backwards and forwards. And they're doing that experiment, and there's, a, a con there's this thing called LISA, the Laser Inter Interferometry um, Satellite, and the idea is to have these two satellites which are beaming a light pulse between them and, again, timing how long it takes between the two and looking for it stretching or, or shrinking and taking a different time, looking for red and blue shift effectively, which would give us a clue that gravity waves are coming through, perhaps from a parallel universe. No one's found one yet. I have an SMS here from uh, Mike in Ivory Park. It says, please ask uh, Chris, why is it that when we lift heavy objects, we tend to bite our bottom lip? Does it give us more strength or it's just one of those useless habits? <laughs> uh, hello, Mike. I don't think it's a useless habit. I think it's part of what we refer to as a gendrassic maneuver. Uh, everyone can try this at home, so you can all have a go. If you cross your legs and tap on the knee on top of your crossed legs on the tendon, just below the kneecap, if you tap it in the right place where a doctor would tap it, you'll make your knee jerk. Your, your foot will fly up in the air a little bit. So everyone have a go, you should be able to do it. Now what you need to do is get an assistant, because what you're going to do is clench your teeth together and also interlink your two hands, and then you bite down hard against your jaw muscles and pull your two hands against each other very hard until you can feel your arms shaking, then re-tap the tendon on your knee 
again, and you'll notice something really quite dramatic, which is that the force of the reflex, the jerk that you get, is much bigger and probably twice as large. And no one knows exactly why this is. Neurophysiologists speculate that this thing called a gendrastic maneuver is probably because in activating all those other muscles, you also facilitate or make it more likely that the motor nerves that are going to make the reflex happen, happen a bit harder. So what we think is going on when maybe tennis players at Wimbledon let out enormous great grunts mm. or when people are trying to lift a heavy object and go yeah. like that and then they grimace, it could be that what they're doing is helping to facilitate or activate as many motor nerve cells in their spinal cord to help that movement happen as possible and that makes the movement as strong as it can be. So I think biting your bottom lip could be part of the same manifestation. You're facilitating as many motor neurons as possible to get as much strength into the movement as you can. One side effect of that is that you do actually screw your face up and look rather strange. Okay, let's go to Teresa in Lone Hill. Hi. Hi, Reedy. Hi, um, Dr. Dr. Chris. I'm just wondering, um, when women go through menopause and have hot flushes, does it serve any benefit the way that, for instance, fevers when when people have flu or viruses um do do they serve any purpose at all apart from uh, irritating hello, you i don't know uh, <laughs> apart from being annoying in yeah. the extreme to the people i speak with who say they're so off-putting and make you feel really self-conscious um i don't think there's any physiological benefit here i think they're a side effect and a very unpleasant one for some people the reason that they happen we think is that normally there is a, a cycle that goes between the brain the region known as the hypothalamus and dangling underneath it the pituitary gland uh, this produces signals including one called fsh follicle stimulating hormone another one called lh luteinizing hormone they go down to the ovary where they control the maturation of follicles which are going to be ovulated as eggs and they also produce from the follicle estrogens and later on if a baby is conceived progesterones those hormones feed back up to the hypothalamus and the pituitary and control the release of those luteinizing hormones and fsh signals when a person goes into the menopause the number of follicles in the ovary falls or dwindles to nearly zero and so as a result or zero subsequently and as a result the feedback loop is broken because there isn't this estrogen signal coming out and going back up to the brain to say turn off the the signal to, to release an egg and as a result the brain thinks that the ovary's gone deaf so it turns up the volume producing more and more of this fsh and lh signal to drive the ovary harder and as a result it's, it starts to cause side effects, which includes includes these hot flushes and these other um, vascular phenomena and the sweating. And fortunately, it does seem to go away in some mm. people, but for, for others, it can be extremely debilitating. And sometimes you have to go and get some help in the form of some hormones like estrogen replacement therapy for a while to help to damp down the levels, and this can make people feel better again. Yusuf, in Rodi Yes, hi, Rodi, how are you? Fine, Yusuf, what's your question? Just a quick question uh, about babies. I just want to find out uh, whether uh, it's possible to determine the IQ and at what age can you do that and how do you go about it, uh, baby's IQ? Interesting. Hmm. Hello, Yusuf. Have you got a baby? Oh, he's gone. <laughs> oh, he's gone. Hmm. Okay. Um, this is a difficult one because what do, we, what do we mean by IQ? Well, IQ stands for intelligence quotient. And this is a set of tests which, administered in a certain way, give you some idea of whether or not an individual has reasoning power. But they are strongly linked to an individual's social upbringing and their social context. In other words, if I gave you a, a word puzzle to do, you could do it because you speak English. But if I gave it to someone who didn't speak English and didn't write in English, they wouldn't have a clue what it was all about, but they could nonetheless be extremely intelligent. So these sorts of tests are very contextual and they're therefore relevant to an individual's social context. And this means that you have to be very careful how you apply them in order to get meaningful results. Now, a baby may not have a command of language, but it nonetheless will be potentially very intelligent and able to learn a language far faster than any adult can. I mean, babies will pick up language without ever having anyone to show them how mm. to do it, usually by the age of two. Whereas when you go to school, if someone says, now you're going to learn French, you have to have a French teacher and 10 years to get any good at it. So <laughs> clearly babies aren't mm. thick, but <laughs> something is changing as we get older and we become better at doing some things than others so i don't think there are any really good tests that will say impartially um this baby has an iq of x you can only 
have directional indicators using the kinds of tests that we do, these reasoning tests and things like that, to sort of give you a clue as to whether or not a child is, is looking like they're going to be very intelligent. But they're, they're always going to have this problem of, well, how much of this is down to an individual's social situation and what they've already been taught compared with what's innately in their uh, psyche making them intelligent. Let's take a break. Stay with us, Chris, and we'll take uh, one more call. The Naked Scientist on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk with Reedy Clappy. Fritz in Sasselberg, thanks for your patience. Good morning. Yes, good morning, Chris. I would like to know if there was any more studies done to communicate with plants and trees. They obviously... In Germany in the 50s put uh, sensors on fat plants and they could communicate it with some kilometers away telepathic to do jobs. Any thumb down since then? Hmm. Hello, Fritz. Uh, To my knowledge, we haven't got any further in our communications with plants, although Prince Charles, member of the British aristocracy, is alleged to spend quite a bit of time (laughs) experimenting, talking to his. Mm. Uh, I can't comment on the outcomes. (laughs) Um, What I will say is that there were some scientists for either party. There were some scientists in, I think they're in Korea, and it was a paper published in the last few years, and they found that they could play sounds to plants, and the plants would grow better or less well. They have suggested that there is a gene which makes the plant sensitive to vibrations, and this, I suppose, could be the reason why, uh, if they're getting vibration from sound, that it might affect the growth of the plants. But plants do communicate with each other, and they do it very well. And they do this chemically. Hang on a second. (laughs) Is that your little one? Yes, it's my son on his way to school. Um, (laughs) They do it chemically, and this is really important because... If a cow comes along and takes a bunch, about a bite out of a plant, then the plant tells all of its plants nearby, I'm being eaten, you need to increase your defences. So there are lots of plants around that produce chemical signals when they are damaged or injured, and those chemical signals diffuse off of that one plant and onto plants nearby, and they make the plant nearby increase its defences or chemicals like nicotine, in the case of a nicotine plant, or to grow more so that it can anticipate damage and be ready to replace the damaged tissue. And some plants go a step further, and they even produce chemicals that attract animals, and those animals are designed to or intended to fend off the attacker. So some plants release chemicals that attract in ants, and the ants then swarm all over the plant and eat the green fly or even eat the elephant, which is preying on the plant, and it's all done chemically. So plants are definitely communicating with animals, but not necessarily by speech. Thank you very much. Interesting uh, a question you asked there, Fritz. Chris, well, say goodbye to your little one. We don't want uh, him or her to go to school <laughs> two without... Of them. Uh, yeah, the with, two of them. Well, we don't want them to go to school without having said goodbye to Daddy. So out you go, quickly. <laughs> or oh, I'll go now. Anyway, bye. goodbye. Bye-bye, and Thank you, everybody. Chris. See you soon. Bye. Take care. And this conversation with Chris is always, always, always available as a podcast.